uh, welcome. So this is our second week of our endocrine uh, month. So we have a very good topic today. This is approach to adrenal insufficiency. We have a uh, chairperson for today is uh, Dr. Florence Tan. She's a senior consultant endocrinologist and also a physician of Hospital Umum Sarawak. So without further ado, we'd like to invite uh, Dr. Florence Tan. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, good afternoon, first of all, to all the participants. And I do agree that uh, today we have a very interesting and uh, clinically very uh, important topic of adrenal insufficiency, when to suspect and how to investigate. So as usual, we have uh, two parts. Firstly, a uh, uh, lecture uh, delivered by Dr. Noor Rafati Ayani Binti Abdullah. She is uh, currently the consultant endocrinologist and physicians at the hospital Sautana Bahia Alaska Kedah. And this will be followed by Q&A session. So all are most welcome uh, to type in your questions in the chat box and uh, we will address it uh, uh, after the lecture. Uh, and uh, you're also welcome to share your comments or experience for the uh, learning uh, uh, for all, all uh, in uh, the webinar this afternoon. So without further ado, uh, let us welcome Dr. Noor Rafati for her lectures on uh, approach to adrenal insufficiency. Over to you. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Florence, uh, for the introduction. So uh, with great pleasure, uh, thank you to the organizing committee for the invitation for me to give a, a small lecture on approach to adrenal insufficiency. So I would like to start my uh, share slide. Okay, I hope everyone can see my slide. So I changed my topic, um, just the title of the topic slightly to approach to adrenal insufficiency. Uh, it's a very broad topic uh, and yet it's very crucial to our day-to-day -day practice. So as everyone can see, uh, two tiny little organs sitting on the kidney, but the function is fundamental uh, for the entire body system. So I'm going to... Um, uh, talk about a few interesting case studies because it's Thursday afternoon. Today is actually the last working day for Kedah and most people are actually uh, on the way to leave the hospital already. So it can be quite uh, tiring for Thursday. Uh, the first case uh, is a 35 years old uh, clinic assistant who presented with lethargy, proximal myopathy, recurrent foot blisters and feeling unwell at home. And he admitted that he has been self-administering I am triamcinolone for the past six months for gouty arthritis, and he was not taking any other medications. And clinically, he was cushionoid with proximal myopathy, facial plethora, round faces, and broad purple striae over the abdomen, lower back, and inner arm with thin skin and easy bruising. So this was the basic blood investigation uh, that we had for him. Uh, his urea was 14, disproportionately increased compared to the creatinine, and his sodium was 130, potassium was 4, and dextrostate was 4. And his basal morning cortisol was low at 60 nanomol per liter. And we sent the ACTH for him, which came back as less than 1.1 picomol per liter. And the reference range that our uh, MOH lab currently is using is 10.2 picomol per liter. So you start wondering what can be the diagnosis for this patient. So he has exogenous Cushing syndrome with adrenal insufficiency secondary to hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or HPA axis suppression. Hence, he was started on hydrocortisone 10 mg at 6 a.m. and the second dose 5 mg at 12 noon, and he was advised to stop the IM triamcinolone. So I'm very sure this is a very common scenario that everyone encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. <laughs> 
So adrenal insufficiency can be defined as the inability of the adrenal cortex to produce sufficient amounts of glucocorticoids and or mineralocorticoids for tissue requirements. So we all know that glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids are essential for energy, salt and fluid homeostasis. Hence, adrenal insufficiency is a very severe and potentially life-threatening condition. So to understand the adrenal insufficiency, one has to understand the normal circadian uh, diurnal rhythm of the cortisol and ACTH secretion. So you all, I'm sure you all can appreciate the parallel correlation between the ACTH and cortisol. And it peaks around five o'clock in the morning. It peaks again uh, around 8 a.m. and then after that, it continues to drop uh, uh, throughout the day and it reaches the nade around 12 midnight. So it, it gets very high upon waking up from sleep and then continues to drop. So this is uh, very different to somebody with Cushing, endogenous Cushing syndrome, whereby there is a loss of normal diurnal rhythm. The clinical presentation of adrenal insufficiency is variable, depending on the extent of loss of adrenal function. I'm sure everybody can still remember those days when we learned about the adrenal cortex. There are three main uh, layers of the uh, adrenal cortex, the glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis, and each layer actually uh, secrete different kinds of hormones. So the presentation of the adrenal insufficiency uh, depend on the extent of the destruction of the adrenal cortex. And the presentation can be very acute or insidious, depending on the underlying cause uh, for the adrenal insufficiency. The diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency depends upon a high level of clinical index. And in some cases, the diagnosis can be delayed because the symptoms are quite vague and non-specific until an intercurrent illness precipitates, whether you are having an acute infection, operation, hemorrhage, infarction, which can actually precipitate an adrenal crisis. So this diagram basically to illustrate uh, the three main classifications of adrenal insufficiency, which can be broadly divided into primary, secondary, and tertiary. So primary adrenal insufficiency is caused by the primary diseases of the adrenal gland, which I will talk about later. So in this uh, situation, uh, there will be reduce cortisol production because of the damage to the adrenal cortex, which will lead to reduced negative feedback to the pituitary. So the pituitary will work hard to produce ACTH to uh, stimulate the adrenal cortex to produce more cortisol. So in primary adrenal insufficiency, the cortisol is low, the ACTH is significantly elevated. Because of the destruction of the uh, adrenal cortex, um, which affect the production of mineralocorticoid from the uh, zona glomerulosa, there will be reduced production of the aldosterone. So reduced production of aldosterone will lead to increased production of renin from the juxtaglomerular apparatus to sustain the intravascular volume, uh, to, to, to improve the intravascular volume. Secondary adrenal insufficiency is due to interference of the ACTH secretion by the pituitary gland. And uh, in these circumstances, you will have reduce cortisol and reduce ACTH production because the damage is primarily affecting the uh, pituitary or the hypothalamus. And in secondary adrenal insufficiency, the renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone system is normally still intact, hence the production of the aldosterone and renin uh, are not affected. In secondary adrenal insufficiency, ACTH deficiency can be isolated or it can occur in conjunction with other pituitary hormone deficiencies. 
Tertiary adrenal insufficiency is due to the suppression of the CRH secreted by the hypothalamus. So biochemically, secondary and tertiary adrenal insufficiency, they look very similar. They have low cortisol and they have low SCTH as well with preservation of the aldosterone and renin. The Common example of the tertiary adrenal insufficiency is exogenous Cushing's, somebody who has been taking uh, corticosteroid for a long time, which will suppress the ACTH uh, production. And the other example for tertiary adrenal insufficiency is cured Cushing syndrome following uh, adrenal adenoma removal or hypophysectomy for uh, pituitary Cushing's disease. Primary adrenal insufficiency uh, to have a significant ACTH elevation is usually more than twofold the upper limit of normal to make the diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency. So this is basically just a slide to illustrate the common examples of the etiologies for primary adrenal insufficiency. Autoimmune adrenalitis is... Um, uh, uh, is reported to be the commonest cause of autoimmune adrenalitis, which can occur uh, as an isolated form or in association with polyglandular autoimmune syndrome. Infectious adrenalitis is still very common, especially we are talking about uh, Malaysia, uh, a, a tropical country whereby infection is still very rampant. TB is still very rampant. So TB adrenalitis is still very common in our country. And we also need to think about other infections such as histoplasmosis, HIV, syphilis, metastatic disease, metastatic cancer from lung, breast, stomach, colon cancer or lymphoma, adrenal hemorrhage or infarction, certain medications such as ketoconazole, fluconazole, metirapun, mitotain or etomidate, and also other conditions such as congenital adrenal hyperplasia and uh, a very rare genetic disease called adrenoleukodystrophy. And examples of um, hypothalamic diseases, uh, uh, the example will be cranial pharyngioma or metastases uh, from the primary cancers, radiation uh, to the, uh, uh, the brain tumors or nasopharyngeal carcinomas, infiltrative disease such as sarcoidosis, Langerhans cell histiocytes histiocytosis, infections, traumatic, severe traumatic brain injury, and also lesions affecting the pituitary, which can be simple adenomas or surgery, radiation, hemochromatosis, hypophysitis, infection, Sheehan syndrome. Uh, it's quite rare now to have Sheehan syndrome, but we all need to be aware about it. Apoplexy, rare genetic mutations, and also empty cella. So what does the Endocrine Society guideline says about adrenal insufficiency? So this endocrine guideline was uh, the one published in 2016. Uh, the paper actually said that if AM cortisol, the basal AM cortisol, less than 140 nanomol per liter is suggestive of adrenal insufficiency. And in AM cortisol less than 3 microgram per deciliter or 82 nanomol per liter is very indicative of adrenal insufficiency. And AM cortisol is less, uh, if it is more than 15 microgram per deciliter or more than 414 nanomol per liter, it's likely exclude adrenal insufficiency. So this basal cortisol is very important because we understand that certain centers, for example, the clinic kesihatan may have difficulty to send uh, more um, extensive investigation, uh, but they can send simple basal cortisol, the morning cortisol, which is usually taken between eight o'clock to nine o'clock in the morning. The classic short synectin test, which is the 250 microgram of synthetic ACTH, is still the diagnostic gold standard test to diagnose primary adrenal insufficiency with a sensitivity of 92%. So how do you do it? 
we do the basal cortisol and ACTH at zero minute, followed by the administration of IV synectin, and followed by measurement of cortisol at 30 minutes and 60 minutes. There have been a lot of studies looking at one microgram ACTH versus 250 microgram ACTH, but so far there has been no statistically significant difference between the low dose and the high dose ACTH stimulation test. So um, in the same breath, a lot of uh, international guidelines still go by the classic 250 microgram ACTH stimulation test. And the paper also said that short synectin test is indicated when the morning cortisol is between 3 to 15 microgram per deciliter, which is between 82 to 414 nanomol per liter. So when we do the test, we want to look at the peak cortisol level at either 30 minutes or 60 minutes. So if the peak cortisol level is less than 500 nanomol per liter, or and the incremental rise of less than 150 nanomol per liter that will indicate adrenal insufficiency. So having said that, this value is very much assay dependent. So we all need to be aware of what kind of assay that we use in our hospital so that we can actually decide on the best cortisol cutoff values. So at the moment, I understand that all hospitals under the Ministry of Health is still using the conventional radioimmunoassay for the uh, cortisol analysis. Some countries, um, especially the Western countries, are already moving towards mass spectrometry, which is a better way to analyze a cortisol level. So the reading will probably change in the future as the tests actually get more sensitive. If somebody is already on hydrocortisone, biochemical testing for the HPA axis should be performed at least 18 to 24 hours after the last dose of the hydrocortisone. And we have to stop it longer for other synthetic glucocorticoids. Short synectin test has been well validated against the insulin tolerance test, and it can also be used for most patients with secondary adrenal insufficiency. However, insulin tolerance tests remain the gold standard diagnostic tool for secondary adrenal insufficiency. We have a lot of problems doing insulin tolerance tests if it is not supervised by an experienced individual, because obviously it involves administration of insulin. You want to bring down the blood sugar down to less than 2.2 uh, with symptomatic hypoglycemia. And obviously it is contraindicated in those with seizures uh, and coronary artery disease. So short synectin test remains the easiest way to test the HPA axis um, uh, system. So back to the patient. So the initial cortisol was less than less than 100, it was 60 nanomol per liter. So the patient was reviewed on a, periodic bas uh, on a periodic basis. And after six months, the AM cortisol has improved to 190 nanomol per liter. So at this juncture, short synectin test was performed. So if you all can see, the peak was less than 500 uh, at 60 minutes. It was only 347 and hydrocortisone was continued at this juncture. So how do we uh, interpret the short synectin? Inadequate cortisol response to ACTH at this point. So the medication was continued and the patient was reviewed again on a periodic basis. And after 15 months, the, a the AM cortisol further improved to 240 nanomol per liter. So at this point, the short synectin test was repeated and the peak cortisol achieved at 60 minutes was 584 nanomol per liter. So this is, in, uh, this is consistent with adequate cortisol response to ACTH. So at this point, the patient um, uh, medication, the hydrocortisone was stopped. So moving on to the second case, 
a 64 years old lady with underlying type 2 DM, hypertension and CKD. She was on myriad of medications, including insulin, uh, basal bolus, atropid and levomir, and also vildagliptin. She had recurrent admissions for lethargy, poor oral intake, recurrent vomiting and hypoglycemia since November 2019. And she also experienced several episodes of seizures attributed to the severe hypoglycemia. She denied taking other medications. So at the beginning, uh, many doctors were attributing the hypoglycemia to the insulin. Clinically, very less body weight and it was also noted interestingly that she had hyperpigmentation over the face, knuckles, palmar creases as well as oral mucosa. Uh, she was tachycardic and BP was 119 over 68, lung was clear uh, and the rest of the other physical examination was unremarkable. When she came, she had uh, acute kidney injury and the potassium was high at 6.7. And upon review of the medical notes, it was also noted that she had recurrent hyperkalemia since 2019 and given lytic cocktails on numerous occasions. And her AM cortisol was 190 nanomol per liter. So at this juncture, we decided to do a synectin test for her and the peak cortisol uh, for her was actually at 30 minutes, 217. I'm not really sure why the reading at 30 minutes uh, and 60 minutes was lower than the baseline. Uh, maybe there was some sampling error at that point, but anyway, it was less than 500 overall. And her ACTH actually came back whopping high at 63 picomol per liter, which is about six times the upper limit of normal. And her aldosterone was very low at less than 103 picomol per liter. And her direct renin was elevated at 120 milliIU per liter. So from the biochemical examination, we can say that this lady has primary adrenal insufficiency, or another term for it is Addison's disease, as evidenced by low cortisol and high ACTH. And there is also evidence of mineral low corticoid deficiency. The CT adrenal was arranged, did not show any evidence of adrenal mass. So you all can see that the adrenal is very thin and slim, uh, which is described classically as inverted V shape. And we also sent 21 hydroxylase antibody to Mayo Clinic, which came back positive. She was started on hydrocortisone 10 milligram at 6 a.m. and 5 milligram at 12 noon. And she was also replaced with mineral low corticoid in the form of fludrocortisone, 0.1 milligram per day. So her diagnosis is autoimmune adrenalitis. So the prevalence of auto, uh, primary adrenal insufficiency is estimated at between 82 to 144 per million, being autoimmunity being the, com the most common cause in adults. However, secondary adrenal insufficiency is to be more common, estimated to be 150 to 280 per million. The most frequent occurrence uh, for adrenal insufficiency is due to be, uh, is due to corticosteroid induced insufficiency despite the incidence is widely debated so how do they present so like i said earlier the symptoms can be very vague and non specific they can present with fatigue weight loss postural dizziness anorexia and abdominal discomfort. They can have hyperpigmentation. And this is, uh, is uh, evident in primary adrenal insufficiency only. Why do they have hyperpigmentation? The high ACTH will stimulate the melanocortin receptor on the skin to produce the hyperpigmentation. So it will happen in the sun exposed areas and the skin creases. And individual with adrenal insufficiency also can have postural hypotension and failure to thrive in children. Biochemically, they can present with hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, hypoglycemia. Very rarely, they can come with hypercalcemia. They don't actually need to have 
all these biochemical abnormalities to have adrenal insufficiency, insufficiency. A lot of times you can probably have one or two features. So that should already alert the possibility of adrenal insufficiency. And how about adrenal crisis, which is the uh, extreme uh, end of the spectrum? They can come with severe weakness, syncope, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, uh, which can mimic acute abdomen, back pain, and confusion. They have hypotension, abdominal tenderness or guarding, reduced conscious, consciousness or delirium. And biochemically, they can have similar features like I mentioned earlier, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, hypoglycemia, and rarely hypercalcemia. So this diagram I borrowed from uh, the up-to-date, basically trying to, uh, to make it easier for everybody uh, to investigate somebody with confirm primary adrenal insufficiency. Uh, need to check the medication, find out what medication the patient is taking. And if they are taking medications such as ketoconazole, metarapone, or mitotain, so yes, it is drug-induced primary adrenal insufficiency. But if they are not taking any adrenal corticolytic medications, we can measure the 21-hydroxylase antibody, which can be done in Gribbles or other private labs. And if the antibodies come back positive, that indicates autoimmune adrenalitis. And we should try to look for other features of polyglandular autoimmune syndrome, such as pernicious anemia, vitiligo, primary hypothyroidism, so on and so forth. In the guideline, it says if the antibodies are negative, we can measure very long chain fatty acid to rule out adrenal leukodystrophy, but I have to admit I have never seen this previously and I have never diagnosed somebody with adrenal leukodystrophy. Maybe Dr. Florence has her personal experience, um, but usually I will go straight to the adrenal CT scan to see whether there's any evidence of adrenal hemorrhage or infiltrative disease, malignancy or possible infection. So the next case is a 62 years old man diagnosed with supraglottic carcinoma, August 2019, and he underwent extensive surgery for the supraglottic carcinoma, completed craniospinal radiotherapy January 2020, and he also completed six cycles of second-line palliative chemotherapy. And during one of the admissions, he was referred to the endocrine team for hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and also hypercalcemia. So this was his blood investigation. Uh, he had a bit of uh, AKI on presentation, hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. His corrected calcium was 3.4 with undetectable IPTH. So that is, in, uh, that is consistent with non-PTH mediated hypercalcemia. His AM cortisol was around 200 and we decided to proceed with a short synectin test, which came back inadequate response with the peak of 287 only at 60 minutes. His thyroid function was normal and his ACTH also was very high at 72 picomol per liter and he also showed evidence of mineralocorticoid deficiency. The aldosterone was less than 103 picomol per liter and very high renin. So we proceeded with the CT adrenals for him, which actually demonstrated bilateral adrenal masses suggestive of adrenal metastases. So this is very different from the first normal CT adrenal that we saw for the second case earlier. So you all can appreciate, uh, you all can appreciate a very large tumor sitting on both kidneys with a large area of necrosis within. And we also stand for 24-hour urine methrin just to rule out the possibility of bilateral pheochromocytoma, but it came back normal. So this patient has primary adrenal insufficiency, secondary to adrenal metastases. The fourth case is a 35 years old lady presented with forgetfulness and profound lethargy. So biochemically, his 
AM cortisol, uh, her AM cortisol was very low at 45 nanomol per liter with very low ACTH, less than 1.1 picomol per liter. And the thyroid axis, the gonadotrophin axis were all affected. So biochemically, this patient has panhypopituitarism. And we also send the serum ACE and also IgG4 for this lady to rule out sarcoidosis and also IgG4 related disease, but that came back uh, normal. Her MRI pituitary showed empty cella with hypothalamic retrochiasmatic lesion with mammillary body involvement. So we were not sure what was the possible etiology for the empty cella. So we actually did several investigations such as lumbar puncture, connective tissue disease screening, tumor markers, TB workout, but all came back negative. And in the ward, after she was started on hydrocortisone, she developed significant polyuria and biochemically confirmed cranial diabetes insipidus. And she was with hydrocortisone, levothyroxine, desmopressin, as well as progaluton. So this is just to illustrate her MRI pituitary. I'm sure you all can see the hypothalamic lesion uh, and Adjacent to it on the uh, uh, sagittal view, everyone can see a flat cell of floor uh, filled with CSF. So this is the classical picture that we see in somebody with empty cell. A normal pituitary should look something like a P shape, but in this lady, you can just see a fine thin of tissue at the base of the cell with no uh, obvious pituitary uh, pituitary tissue. So this lady has panhypopituitarism and cranial DI secondary to empty cella and retrochiasmatic mass, which we are not sure what's the cause. The fifth case is a 17 years old girl referred to endocrine for primary amenorrhea and short stature. Clinically, she was very short, less than third centile, small face and small chin with uh, a delayed breast and pubic hair development at 10 one. And clinically, she did not have features to suggest Turner syndrome and the karyotype actually came back as 46XX and the trans abdominal ultrasound showed very small underdeveloped uterus. So we did the blood investigation, showed low IGF-1, low T4 and inappropriately normal thyroid and low FSH and LH and estradiol, which is consistent with the prepubertal stage. Uh, the AM cortisol was 180. She had a delayed bone age at 13 years old. And we did an MRI pituitary because biochemically, we know that something is not right with the pituitary and uh, hypothalamic area. And she actually showed features consistent with pituitary aplasia. So this is just to illustrate her MRI pituitary. Basically, it's very difficult for you to identify the pituitary tissue. Um, so there is a complete devoid of pituitary tissue there. So for this patient, we actually decided to do an insulin tolerance test and also a glucagon stimulation test. If you all can remember, the IGF-1 was, was low, so we wanted to rule out growth hormone deficiency as well for this patient. So that's why we decided to do an insulin tolerance test. So in insulin tolerance, Test, we administer 0.15 unit per kg of insulin to induce significant hypoglycemia. So in this lady, we, uh, she managed to achieve uh, adequate hypoglycemia when the RBS was 2.2 uh, with symptoms. And we actually sampled her cortisol and also growth hormone every 30 minutes. So her peak cortisol at 150 minutes was 840 nanomol per liter. And we also did the glucagon stimulation test uh, with the peak of 440. So having said that glucagon stimulation test is good to, uh, to um, 
to diagnose somebody with growth hormone deficiency, but it is not the gold, the gold standard test uh, to, uh, to verify the integrity of the cortisol axis. So a lot of literatures actually quote that for glucagon stimulation test, if your cortisol value is less, is more than 350 nanomol per liter, it is already considered adequate. So what does this lady has? She has adequate cortisol response with severe growth hormone deficiency. Because you all can see that the growth hormone uh, was very flat, not even reaching one microgram per liter. So the sixth case is a 79 years old gentleman with chronic myeloid monocytic leukemia, dysplastic changes with blast less, less than 5%, was tested on asacitidine. He responded well with normalization of blood counts in 2015. Unfortunately, in June 2017, he had a rapid disease progression during the chemotherapy cycle and the white cell actually went up to 63, hemoglobin was 11.4, thrombocytopenia platelet was 66, blast was 83%, and likely at that time, he had a transformation to acute myeloid leukemia. So the standard dose for uh, chemotherapy would be low dose cytarabine at that time, but unfortunately he was admitted for pneumonia, so a more definitive chemotherapy had to be deferred. He received broad spectrum antibiotics in the ward and showed a gradual improvement. Unfortunately, just before he was planned for discharge, he developed rapid onset of polyuria, 10 liters over one evening, with marked increase of sodium from 144 to 176 over 24 hours. So this is basically just to illustrate his sodium trend from the bottom upwards and the highest sodium he had uh, was 176 millimol per liter. Corrected calcium was 2.5. His serum osmo was 358 milliosmol per kilo uh, with a very, very diluted urine at 167 milliosmol per kilo. So what can, uh, what can you do at this point and what do you think is the underlying uh, diagnosis? So we managed to send some uh, baseline uh, pituitary hormones for this uh, unfortunate gentleman. His cortisol came back as 143. ACTH was 19 nanogram, uh, nanogram per liter. LH and FSH was inappropriately normal for a very low testosterone, less than 0 0.5 nanomol per liter. Um, and also his... TSH was below the reference range and free T4 and free T3 was also low. So the case was actually discussed with the registrar on call at that time, who decided to do a short synectin test the very next day. So this was the result of the short synectin test. So if you all can see the peak for the short synectin was at 60 minutes when the cortisol actually went up to 504 nanomol per liter. So what do you think is the interpretation of this short synectin test? So the registrar, when he saw this result interpreted uh, as a normal adequate response uh, to the uh, short synectin test. However, after the case was discussed with the endocrinology team, we decided to put the patient on desmopressin 100 microgram uh, twice a day for the cranial diabetes insipidus and also start him on hydrocortisone uh, twice a day and levothyroxine 50 microgram per day in view of the abnormal thyroid function test. So what can we learn from this short synectin test that was done from this gentleman? Short synectin test should not be used in acute pituitary insult. So if you want to do a short synectin test in secondary adrenal insufficiency, you need to give some time, need to wait for at least six weeks uh, for the short synectin test to be uh, valid because the adrenal cortex 
will take about six weeks and above uh, to be atrophic uh, for the result to be valid. So this gentleman actually had MRI pituitary, which actually showed a small focal non-enhancing area at the uh, posterior pituitary consistent with either infarct or hemorrhage. Leukemic infiltration, uh, uh, we had difficulty trying to rule that out radiologically. So this gentleman had panhypopituitarism and cranial diabetes insipidus secondary to pituitary infarct or hemorrhage to rule out leukemic infiltration. So this gentleman actually subsequently had lumbar puncture, which confirmed extensive involvement of CSF by the blast and also atypical monocytoid cells, confirming the CNS infiltration. So he has been managed with intratical chemotherapy um, since then. So what are the caveats when we do the short synectin test? Uh, we have to understand that plasma cortisol about 80% is bound to corticosteroid binding globulin or CBG and about 10 to 15% uh, is bound to albumin. So any condition that can reduce the cortisol binding globulin, for example, inflammation, nephrotic syndrome, liver disease, immediate post-op operation or critically unwell patient requiring intensive care, rare genetic disorders, or condition that will increase the cortisol binding globulin, such as estrogen, pregnancy, or mitotin, we need to consider all these factors to interpret the plasma cortisol level. If somebody is on progaluton, on any estrogen, we need to stop the uh, OCP for at least six weeks before we uh, decide to uh, measure the cortisol or do a short synectin test for the individual. So for adrenal insufficiency in acutely sick patients with clinical signs and symptoms, treatment should be instituted without delay. Don't wait for the blood investigation results to be back. However, before the administration of hydrocortisone, it is extremely helpful if we can do a single baseline ACTH and cortisol for our later assessment. So what do we do in acute adrenal crisis? Establish good venous access, draw bloods for the electrolytes, the glucose, measure the cortisol and ACTH, and infuse normal saline uh, depending on the uh, fluid status of the patient, uh, careful monitoring of the IO chart, and give hydrocortisone 100 milligram IV bolus followed by 50 milligram IV every six hours. Or if you decide you want to do infusion, you can give 200 milligram continuous infusion over 24 hours. And if hydrocortisone is unavailable, you can consider other alternatives. But most of the time, I think uh, in the MOH facilities, we can have access to hydrocortisone. So after subsequent stabilization, what do we do? We can slow down the infusion rate and also search for the possible uh, precipitating causes and gradually taper down the parenteral glucocorticoid over the next one to three days. And once the patient is stable, uh, can do a short synectin test. This can be done as inpatient or outpatient, depending on the clinical circumstances of the patient, depending on the safety profile. So usually what we do, we normally put the patient on a physiological dose of oral hydrocortisone first and omit the hydrocortisone about 24 hours prior to the test and determine the type of the adrenal insufficiency if we have not done that. And in somebody with suspected primary adrenal insufficiency, start uh, mineralocorticoid replacement with fludrocortisone. So what would be the recommended dose of glucocorticoid? Uh, the recommended dose according to the Endocrine Society guideline usually is between 15 to 25 milligram per day or five to eight milligram per meter 
the square body surface area in two or three doses. So the highest dose should be in the morning at awakening. And the second dose, if you want to, to give a two dose regimen, uh, would be in the afternoon. If you want to put somebody on a third dose regimen, the third dose should be late afternoon. I normally give not later than 4 p.m. Uh, because if you give it too late, then the patient will have insomnia uh, nighttime. The longer acting glucocorticoids can be used in selected cases, for example, those who are non compliant to their medications, for example, prednisolone 5 mg OD. Dexamethasone should not be used because it has a very long half life, it does not allow diurnal replacement, and very likely uh, possibility of inducing iatrogenic Cushing syndrome. So how do we monitor glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid replacement? It's usually done via clinical assessment, looking at the body weight, the postural blood pressure, uh, the energy level, and also signs of uh, frank glucocorticoid excess. And if somebody is on fludrocortisone, we normally will measure their blood pressure, sitting and standing, look at the electrolytes. If they have too much fludrocortisone, they will get hypertension and hypokalemia, and also the renin level will be elevated. So how about long-term monitoring for this patient? It's really important that all clinicians to teach all patients with adrenal insufficiency about the stress dose and also to obtain any emergency steroid card or bracelets or necklace uh, regarding adrenal insufficiency. And if possible, to provide emergency kit containing injectable uh, high-dose glucocorticoid. Uh, I have to say so far in Hospital Sultanah Bahia, we have not been uh, able to provide the hydrocortisone emergency kit yet as for now, but at least they have the uh, steroid treatment card. So how do we manage these individuals in specific situation? So if they are at home with illness and fever, you advise the patient about the sick day rules to get them to double or triple the hydrocortisone dose until recovery. So you can do that usually two to three days, get them to drink plenty of fluids, doesn't need to change the mineralocorticoid dose, just double or triple the dose of the glucocorticoid. And if the condition worsens for more than three days, please go and see the doctor. And if they are unable to tolerate because of gastroenteritis, uh, you can administer IV uh, hydrocortisone. And how about surgeries? If it is a major surgery, we can administer IV hydrocortisone injection 100 milligram followed by 200 milligram of hydrocortisone over 24 hours, either continuous infusion or 50 milligram every six hours. And subsequently, after the surgery, the IV hydrocortisone can be tapered down to oral hydrocortisone depending on the clinical state of the patient. So this diagram basically just to illustrate the uh, comparative anti-inflammatory effect of the hydrocortisone. I know now a lot of physicians are involved caring for COVID-19 patients who require mega doses of uh, corticosteroids. So basically this conversion chart can help you to decide if you want to actually switch from um, metalprednisolone to dexamethasone or uh, IV hydrocortisone or prednisolone. So how, how I remember it, five milligram of prednisolone is equivalent to 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone uh, and equivalent to four milligrams of metalprednisolone and equivalent to 0 0.75 milligram of dexamethasone. And Hydrocortisone has the shortest half-life between 8 to 12 hours, and the longest half-life will be the dexamethasone. Glucocorticoid, depending on the type, 
for example, the hydrocortisone has the highest mineralocorticoid property compared to prednisolone, but dexamethasone does not have any mineralocorticoid property. So fludrocortisone does not have any anti-inflammatory effect and the usual dose would be between 0.1 to 0.2 milligram per day. So how to summarize uh, our discussion today, uh, the important salient features would be the diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency requires a high degree of clinical suspicion as the symptoms can be very vague and nonspecific. We should start the treatment without delay in adrenal crisis. Don't wait for the blood investigation. And short synectin test is well validated for primary adrenal insufficiency. And it can be used in most cases of secondary adrenal insufficiency and tertiary adrenal insufficiency. But it should not be used in uh, secondary adrenal insufficiency of recent onset. And when we do the test, we also have to bear in mind the general condition of the patient. What is the albumin status and whether there, there are conditions that can affect the cortisol binding globulin of the patient. And last but not least, patient education and reinforcement about sick day rules is very crucial to prevent adrenal crisis. We need to do this over and over again every time we see the patient in our clinic. Okay, yeah, so yeah. I think that's my slide. So I think uh, we all agree that this is a very comprehensive uh, coverage of uh, approach to adrenal insufficiency. And also Dr. Rafati has shown us many interesting uh, cases covering the uh, different scenario where adrenal insufficiency can present and uh, different uh, highlights in terms of management. So I think we have a few questions, but, uh, but just before answering the questions, I think uh, uh, could uh, Dr. Rafati uh, tell us, is there any difference in terms of the management for primary versus secondary uh, adrenal insufficiency? Okay, yes, definitely there is a, a significant difference. So like what we learned just now, the primary adrenal insufficiency, you can have glucocorticoid and or mineralocorticoid deficiency. So you can either have just the glucocorticoid deficiency alone, but if the disease is very extensive, you will have mineralocorticoid deficiency. So patients with primary adrenal insufficiency, most of the time they will require uh, replacement with glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid. So in this country, we have fludrocortisone to replace the mineralocorticoid deficiency. As opposed to secondary adrenal insufficiency, the uh, mineralocorticoid um, uh, deficiency does not occur. They only have glucocorticoid deficiency. Uh, there's no destruction of the uh, adrenal cortex uh, which takes place and uh, the mineralocorticoid axis is normally regulated by the renin angiotensin aldosterone system in secondary adrenal insufficiency. Thereby, for secondary adrenal insufficiency, they normally only require the glucocorticoid replacement. They do not require mineralocorticoid replacement. Yeah, I think we kind of answer one of the questions uh, asking when we will start fudrocortisone in mm. insufficiency. So we are only yeah. start fudrocortisone for primary adrenal insufficiency uh, or uh, when you are in doubt whether it's primary, secondary in acute adrenal crisis. The other thing about, uh, I think Dr. Rafati showed you the different uh, steroids uh, uh, preparations. So those uh, hydrocort have mineral corticoid uh, uh, activity. So at a dose of above 50 or 100 milligrams per day, they have enough pseudocorticone or mineral corticoid uh, activity. So if you are giving someone with acute adrenal insufficiency IV hydrocort at 50 milligrams six hourly, you do not need to give pseudo because the IV hydrocort preparation will have enough mineral corticoid uh, uh, activity. It's when you tell it down to maintenance dose of 10, 5, 
uh, or 20 10, then you can add in fluidocortisone if you think that patients have primary adrenal insufficiency. And as such, a lot of time we do not um, recommend dexamethasone for adrenal crisis because dexamethasone does not have fluidocortisone, uh, I mean, does not have mineral corticoid uh, activity. So we actually recommend IV hydrocortisone, right? So yes, uh, yes. that answers our question. Uh, the other case that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, first, the form of fifth case about the patients with normal sinusal test uh, in the yeah. hypopic patients that uh, apart from um, when it's in acute setting where the adrenal has not had time to atrophy, acute uh, setting of SCPH deficiency, you may get a normal uh, short sinusal test result. The other uh, scenario is actually uh, actually also relevant to that patient is when you have patients with hypothyroidism, right? So mm. in patients with hypothyroidism, the metabolism of cortisol is also being slowed down or delayed and you can get a falsely normal uh, short sinusal test result or even uh, falsely normal test my cortisol level. And that is why patients with pain hypopic can have pain hypopic uh, for many years without a dystonian crisis uh, in uh, not severe stress because they also have hypothyroidism that sort of conserves the remaining uh, cortisol reserve or glutal corticoid reserve. Mm -hmm. And that is also the reason for the teaching that when you want to start someone with L-thyroxine replacement for hypopic, uh, you should always start the hydrocort together, otherwise you will actually precipitate a, a dystonian crisis. Uh, yeah. So we uh, get caught, uh, sometimes we get caught that we do not recognize secondary hypothyroidism. That means a patient with a low free T4 but normal TSH. So mm. this is not primary hypothyroidism. This is actually secondary hypothyroidism due to pitch three disease. And we have patients who are started on l thyroxine thinking it's just a normal hypothyroidism presenting in the ED later with hypotension, hyponatremia because of adisonian crisis. So if in doubt, uh, we treat the hypothyroid, give the hydrocort. Once the thyroid function is normalized, you can do the assessment for your HPA acid, just to mm -mm. highlight on that, right? Yep, agree. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have another question. How long before can we expect adrenal crisis to occur after bilateral adrenal infarction typically? Mm. Okay. Well, so far, I think I have been fortunate because I have not encountered bilateral adrenal infarction. But uh, for primary adrenal uh, insufficiency, normally they need to have a significant destruction of the adrenal cortex, isn't it, Dr. Florence? Usually more than 90% destruction to, to, to present uh, with adrenal insufficiency. So it can be pretty acute if the infarction or the hemorrhage um, uh, occurs in uh, and affect a significant portion of the adrenal cortex. So I would say it's an acute uh, phenomena. Okay, so uh, I think the scenario I can uh, imagine is the uh, meningeal coccinia, where you have mm. Frederick or uh, Waterson. Yeah, Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is actually <laughs> acute because the cortisol half life I think is very short, one or two hours. So if the patient is not in stress, you may have you may not manifest, but in someone with septic senior, in uh, in severe stress, a uh, uh, bilateral adrenal acute infarct will manifest very, very acutely uh, at emergency. So you need to replace it uh, straight away, right? So that is mm. uh, the thing about yeah. uh, acute It's infarct. something like pituitary apoplexy, isn't it? Yeah. It happens acutely, abruptly. So the adrenal crisis can be very abrupt as well. So anything vascular in origin, uh, in fact, hemorrhage that can be very abrupt. Okay, so uh, I think uh, there are a few questions about uh, hydrocort replacement, uh, titration. Uh, do we titrate based on the short sinusal test result to a maximum dose? Do we titrate based on baseline cortisol levels? 
uh, okay. Do we titrate the replacement dose based on the early morning cortisol level? Okay. Um, I would probably say um, most of the time, I would go by the clinical presentation of the patient. How does the patient uh, is, uh, uh, you know, how is the energy level? What is the blood pressure like? And also uh, the, uh, the, the weight, whether they, are whether they are actually showing symptoms of under replacement of over replacement rather than uh, going by the uh, cortisol level. I know that there are certain centers, for example, when I was in Manchester, we used to do the cortisol day curve uh, which can be the blood cortisol day curve or the salivary cortisol day curve. Uh, and you can actually use that for selected patients. Uh, for example, if you, if you cannot see, uh, if, you, uh, if you can see a discrepancy between what the patient is telling you and what you see in front of you, so you can actually consider doing that, but it's in only uh, selected cases. Most of the time, I will go by clinical uh, to assess uh, the patient, uh, whether they are actually being under-replaced or over-replaced. So go by clinical parameters rather than the level itself. Yeah, I agree. Actually, we do not use cortisol level to titrate because if you have adrenal insufficiency that is permanent, the cortisol level will be forever low. Um, and um, so uh, you won't actually need to monitor uh, once you have made a diagnosis of permanent adrenal insufficiency. You do not need to monitor the cortisol anymore, uh, unlike uh, for thyroid replacement for hypopaid or hypothyroidism. So the uh, management is purely clinical. Uh, the only time we will monitor for the baseline or short sentence test if we expect recovery of the cortisol uh, secretion for the adrenal and this can occur especially in patients with exogenous Cushing syndrome. Exactly yeah. yeah just like the first patient that I presented earlier uh, because you want to see the excess recovery. Correct so what we do we are actually for my I will just ask the patient to off the hydrocortisone the PM dose as well as the morning dose of the AAM cortisol. So mm, tomorrow yeah. you're going to take AAM cortisol, you, stop, you can still take your morning hydrocort, but you stop the PM dose. Tomorrow morning you stop the AM dose, take the blood, and then take back the hydrocort. If the yeah. best uh, AAM cortisol is still very low, so different cut off as you, so if below 100, you do not need to proceed to short transition test. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to very straight, you can use the SD4. I just easy for me, 100. Or sometimes some people use below 150, so up to your clinical assessment. Mm -hmm. So you will repeat this three or four months later to see whether the basal cortisol uh, recovered. If it's 400, double check that the patient had all the hydrocort before checking the blood test. If they have above 350 or 400, you can safely or meet or stop the hydrocort replacement in someone with exogenous crushing. Somewhere in between or in doubt that's when you proceed to the short transition test to see whether they can respond to stress um, adequately. Sometimes I know uh, difficulty to get the sinusin. So what I do is those uh, level above 300, 350, relatively educated patients, I will actually stop daily hydrocortisone replacement but I just advise them on stress dose. That means when they are unwell, they need to tap back the hydrocort at double or triple the dose or tap back the uh, basal replacement. Those only for those patients you think that can be quite educated. If they are very blur one, then I will just proceed with a short sentence test. So that also uh, answered uh, about the question about this continuing steroid replacement. It can mm. take months, it can take years, depends on the patient's profile. Yeah. Right. Hi, the Doctor. Other, uh, yeah. Now, uh, for the past four minutes, maybe another two uh, questions, two, three questions here. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, uh, photocortisone again is my clinical status, high raining, 
low aldosterone, but you don't have to have that. You can, if the blood pressure is low, hyperkalemia, you can presume it. But if mm. you can do a rending, that will be good as been shown in the uh, few cases. So yeah. that is the answer for when to start hydrocortisone. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, the other question about short sentence test is 250 might that is the preparation we have so forget about the low dose uh, i think uh, <laughs> we do not need to know about the low dose yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh any other questions i think uh do different theory affect the morning cortisol yes uh yes. prednisolone mm -hmm. hydrocort can be measured that's why you have to store it for 20 hours that star cannot be measured but it will suppress the cortisol right yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's all. Any, uh, any comment, last minute, uh, play, uh, last comment, uh, Rafati? Um, well, yeah, I think basically just everybody has to be on their toes to look uh, for signs and symptoms of adrenal insufficiency and act fast uh, if the clinical suspicion is there uh, uh, and send the uh, basal cortisol and also the ACTH before the administration, but you don't have to wait for the results to be back because that will be helpful for us to uh, eventually search for the underlying uh, etiology. Yeah, I think that is uh, very important. So if you have a cortisol during stress, during inotrop, and your cortisol is less than 500 or 550 cut off, basically you already do a short cylinder test or even ITT. So the patient does not respond to stress, you can actually make the diagnosis. So the cortisol, before you start the IV hydrocort in someone that you uh, suspect adrenal crisis, it will be very helpful. It set up the problem of repeating the short sentence test later. Mm -hmm. uh, just another uh, thing I want, just want to highlight is uh, patients who admitted with recurrent hyponatremia and treated as AGE, a lot of them have hypocortisolism. Some of them due to hypopit. Uh, due to MPC radiation many yes. years before. So MPC radiation is uh, quite common. MPC rate is quite high in Sarawak. So five or 10 years after MPC radiation, they can develop hypophyte, manifest as recurrent emission for vomiting, diarrhea, treated level as AGE with hyponatremia and poor oral impact. So do look out for those patients. Okay. I think that's all. I'm sorry, uh, we are seven minutes uh, over, but I think this is very interesting and interactive. Uh, yeah. Thank you for all your participation. Thanks uh, okay. to Dr. Florence and also Dr. Rafati for the great session for today. Okay. So we'll wrap up for this week's session. We'll meet for next week, third week, is management of thyroid storm. So see you guys. Take care. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Rafati. Okay, thanks, Dr. Florence.